Today's story is both shocking and complicated, taking not just a year, but nearly a decade to find any justice. It's about a 21-year-old nun whose brutal murder in 1992 was finally solved after 28 years, in December 2020. This is the story of Sister Abhaya. This story begins in the quiet town of Kotayam, Kerala, back in 1992. Like many other Christian areas in Kerala, Kotayam was a peaceful place with churches and convents scattered all around. These places of worship were an important part of life for the people living there. One of the well-known convents in the area was the St. Pius X convent. It had a hostel where many young women came to study and stay, many of whom were also nuns. Among these women was 21-year-old Sister Abhaya, a dedicated young woman who had come to the convent to serve God and help others. Sister Abhaya was studying at a pre-degree college, and like any student, she had exams coming up. Determined to do well, she decided to wake up early one morning to get some extra studying done. She set her alarm, went to bed, and woke up around 4 a.m. After greeting a few of her friends in the convent, she sat down to begin her studies. Around that time, she felt the need to take a short break. She left her books and went to the kitchen, possibly to drink some water or splash her face with cold water to stay awake. The next morning, when the other nuns woke up, they noticed something unusual. Sister Abhaya was missing. This seemed strange to them. When they went to the kitchen, they found a water bottle with its cap open, water spilled on the floor, and one of Sister Abhaya's slippers lying there. But where was Sister Abhaya? No one knew. The search became more urgent, and soon, they found Sister Abhaya's other slipper near the convent's well. And when one of the nuns went near the well and looked inside, she was terrified to see Sister Abhaya's lifeless body. The fire department arrived, the police were called, and eventually, Sister Abhaya's body was pulled out of the well. The nuns and hostel residents were in complete shock. Just the night before, they had shared dinner with her, laughed, made plans for the future, and even got annoyed by her early morning alarm. Now, that same friend was being carried out lifeless from the well. The local police officer, V. V. Augustine, arrived as part of the usual process. After the body was recovered, he wrote a report, called a photographer to take pictures of the scene and the body, and then sent the body for an autopsy. During the autopsy, doctors noticed cuts and bruises, found a head injury, and listed the cause of death as drowning. Even though Sister Abhaya had a head injury, the cause of death was still marked as suicide, with the possibility of murder. At that time, many people found this explanation hard to believe. Why would Sister Abhaya set an alarm just to end her life? The fridge door was left open, the bottle's cap was off, water was spilled, and her slipper was left on the floor. Everything seemed too hurried. The story didn't make sense to people. Many believed that this wasn't a suicide, but a murder. They also felt that someone was trying to cover up the truth, especially because the incident took place inside a convent. Sister Abhaya's death took place in a convent where hundreds of girls came to study, learn about religion, and live. Such a tragic event happening in a place like that was very unusual. This incident, along with the suspected cover-up, deeply unsettled the community. An activist named Joman Putin Parakal formed a committee to seek justice. On April 16th, the case was handed over to the crime branch. After a few months of investigation, the crime branch released its report. The case was taken out of the local police's hands and given to the crime branch, who spent months investigating. In the end, they concluded that Sister Abhaya's death was a suicide. By then, Sister Abhaya had already been buried and her clothes were destroyed, leaving very little medical evidence behind. However, the case had become a huge topic of discussion in Kerala. The media was full of stories, and people across the state were coming up with their own theories about what had really happened. The nuns were unhappy with how things were going. There was pressure from the media, from activists, and even from society itself. Naturally, the case was passed to a higher authority. The Central Bureau of Investigation, CBI took over, and a fresh investigation began. 
the CBI started with a new approach, looking for fresh clues and talking to old witnesses again. Everything seemed to be moving smoothly, but then something very strange and shocking happened. A CBI officer, Varghese P. Thomas, held a press conference in 1994 and revealed something surprising. He said that he had been under pressure to declare the case as a suicide. Because of this, he chose to leave his job almost nine years before he was supposed to retire. You can imagine the chaos that followed his statement. The case became a big news story again. People couldn't understand why it was getting so confusing. Where was this pressure coming from? Why was the case so difficult to solve? The CBI team continued to investigate for quite some time, even though they didn't have much medical proof. Later, they carried out several dummy tests. They made a doll the same size and weight as Sister Abhaya and threw it into the well in different ways. They carefully observed where the doll got injured and compared those injuries to the ones found on Sister Abhaya. However, even after these tests, no clear answers came up. So in 1996, three years after the investigation started, a report was submitted. It stated, We believe this should be treated as a murder case. We tried everything possible to find out who might be responsible for this tragic event. But despite all our efforts, we couldn't get any solid results. Four years after the incident, despite the efforts of the local police, the crime branch, and now the CBI, we still didn't know what really happened to Sister Abhaya. The earlier report was rejected, and a new CBI team was assigned. This new team carried out another investigation, and by 1999, three years later, they came to the conclusion that Sister Abhaya's death seemed like a murder. The main reason for this conclusion was the medical findings. This time, not just one doctor, but a group of three doctors looked at the body. They found several injuries that were not mentioned in the first post-mortem report. These injuries had been missed earlier. Now, let's go back to the day of the incident. Many nuns were at the convent and noticed more injuries on Sister Abhaya's body. V. V. Augustine, the officer I talked about earlier, had even called a photographer to the scene. The photographer closely examined Sister Abhaya's body and took pictures that showed extra marks of injuries not mentioned in the earlier report or post-mortem. When her body was taken out, many nuns were nearby, and they also saw these injuries. They noted several marks that hadn't been included in the original post-mortem report. After seven years of investigation, it became clear that Sister Abhaya did not take her own life. It looked more like a murder, but who did it? The answer will surprise you even more. The CBI admitted, we know it's a murder, but we still don't know who the killer is. Once again, the court refused to accept this report. Another team was formed, and in 2005, a new investigation was done. Again, it was stated that the killers could not be identified, and once more, the court did not accept this report. The activists outside, part of the action committee, were now angry. Many talks and conspiracy theories started popping up. Some media reports suggested that the first investigation was poorly handled. They claimed that Sister Abhaya was buried too quickly, her clothes were burned, and even her diary was destroyed. They felt the post-mortem was incomplete and suspected that powerful people were trying to cover this up. Various theories spread quickly across Kerala. How could such a chaotic scene be part of the case? Why did the evidence disappear? Then, a new team began investigating again, and in 2007, a shocking revelation came to light. By now, the case had been under investigation for 15 years. There were many witnesses, but some had turned against the case, and others had even died. Many suspects had been questioned, but no solid proof was found against anyone. Then, out of nowhere, a witness stepped forward, offering a key clue to the case. But who was this witness? The witness was none other than a thief, an ordinary, unknown thief from 1992. Could his testimony really be trusted? Surprisingly, not only was his statement taken seriously, but it also changed the entire direction of the case. If you watch till here, 
please give a like to this video and do complete our 30,000 subscribers. Thank you. This man was a Dhaka Raju, who admitted that he had committed thefts around 1992. He used to steal from different places, sell the stolen items, and use the money to feed himself and his family. On March 27th, a Dhaka Raju went to St. Pius Convent with the plan to steal. His goal was to climb to the roof of the convent, where there were copper rods and wires meant to protect against lightning, take them, and sell them. He arrived in the dark of night to carry out his theft, but what he saw there was so unusual that it stayed in his mind for years. He noticed someone sneaking onto the campus in the dark, and the presence of that person was very strange. He saw a priest there, Father Thomas Cawdor. This raised a question. What was a priest doing in the girls' hostel at such a late hour? Adaka Raju claimed he also saw Ndhose Jose Putrikail and Sister Sifi. This is where things get really creepy. As mentioned earlier, Raju had a simple way of working. He would steal items from different places and sell them to a scrap dealer. That night, when he witnessed the strange incident, he felt helpless. How could he speak up when he was there to commit a crime? The next day, he read about Sister Abhaya and then saw the police's comments about her case. That's when he began to feel that something was truly wrong. He had gone to steal, and if he told anyone about that night, he would have to admit to his own crime. Adaka Raju did something surprising. He went to the police and told them what he saw that night. Imagine what happened next when they heard his story. The police listened to his account and then arrested him, accusing him of the murder. They created a simple theory. A Dhaka Raju entered the convent that night to steal. While he was stealing, he ran into a nun. When she screamed, he panicked, killed her, and tossed her body into the well before escaping. Simple. A Dhaka Raju was held for 58 days, during which he reportedly faced different kinds of torture. He said he was pressured to take the blame for the murder. He claimed he was offered bribes, money, a job, help for his children's schooling, and even a house, if he confessed to the crime. His scrap dealer, Shamir, was also said to be tortured and pushed to blame Raju for everything. However, both Adaka Raju and Shamir refused to back down. When Raju wouldn't give in to the lure of money, they threatened him with several false charges. But what made him stand firm against this corrupt system? It was his honesty. Later, throughout this dirty game, Adaka Raju was the one who stood strong in his truth, the same petty thief from before, whom even the court admired. From this point, the case takes a new turn. The CBI now had two main suspects, Father Thomas Couture and Father Jose Putricayil. In fact, a neighbor who lived near the convent claimed he had seen Father Thomas Couture's scooter parked there. On the night of March 26th, this neighbor went to a nearby shop for tea, and when he returned around midnight, he noticed the scooter outside the convent. At the time, he didn't think much of it. However, later he changed his story, saying, I said that under pressure. He was one of many witnesses who turned against the case. But hold on. When Adaka Raju told the police about this, they already knew there were some suspects. Why didn't they investigate this further? Why didn't they look into Raju's account even a little bit? Or was someone telling them to set up Raju? Raju was being offered money. Who had enough money to back that? And the biggest question was, if Raju was telling the truth, what was Father Kador doing at the convent that night? A rumor started to spread that Father Kotor had told a friend he and Sister Sefi from the convent were like a married couple. Even before this, many people had raised similar claims. Some of the nuns in the convent discussed it among themselves, and others outside shared their thoughts too. Finally, in 2008, based on Raju's statement, the CBI named Father Thomas Couture, Sister Sefi, and Father Jose Putricayil as the main suspects in this murder case. After this, the defense lawyer for the accused tried to undermine witness Raju by painting him as a professional criminal in court. 
he brought up about ten criminal cases against Raju, most of which had him as the accused. Raju did not deny his criminal past, which turned the lawyer's argument against him. Even though he admitted to his previous crimes, Raju stood firm in his testimony, determined to seek justice for Sister Abhaya's murder. Because of his statement, Father Thomas Couture, Sister Sefi, and Father Jose Putrikail were all sent to Bengaluru for narco tests. The doctor in charge of the tests was named Malini. The results of the tests were recorded on three CDs, which were then sent to the Kerala Judiciary Court and the Kerala High Court. However, it was later found that the CDs containing the narco test results had been tampered with. Dr. Malini was called to explain this issue, but she had been suspended some time earlier, leaving the narco test reports incomplete. Everyone present during the narco tests was questioned. However, everyone claimed that no one had tampered with the CDs. To find out the truth, the narco test CDs were sent to the Central for Development of Imaging Technology. CDIT. The CDIT analyzed the digital evidence and discovered that the first CD belonged to Father Thomas Couture. It contained a full recording of 32 minutes and 50 seconds that had been edited more than 30 times. The CD of Father Jose's test was 40 minutes and 55 seconds long and had been edited 19 times. The last CD was for Sister Sefi's narco test, which recorded 18 minutes and 42 seconds and had been edited 23 times. After the tampering incident, the Kerala High Court ordered the CBI to present the original CDs related to the narco tests in court within 10 days. But just a few days later, the original recordings of the narco tests for Father Thomas Couture, Sister Sefi, and Father Jose were shown on a local TV station in Kerala. How this broadcast happened and who aired it is still unknown, but the original narco test recordings revealed how Father Thomas Couture and Father Jose committed the murder. According to their narco test recordings, on the morning of March 27, 1992, Sister Abhaya woke up at 4 a.m. It was quite warm, so she went from her hostel room to the fridge to get some water. While she was drinking, she heard some noises coming from the kitchen. When Abhaya went to check, she found Father Couture, Father Jose, and Sister Sefi in a compromising situation. In that moment, before she could run away, they attacked Sister Abhaya with deadly intent. Sister Sefi grabbed an axe from the kitchen and hit her on the head, and the post-mortem report confirmed she had head injuries. After that, they dragged her to the well and threw her in to cover up their crime. After this CD was aired, the CBI started questioning all three of them in their office. However, in 2009, all three were released on bail. It was shocking that Father Jose was cleared of any wrongdoing in this case. From 2009 to 2019, many hearings took place, and in 2020, the Kerala High Court sentenced Father Thomas Couture and Sister Sefi to life in prison based on the narco test results and Raju the thief's testimony. The court also fined both of them five lakh rupees, Thus, after 28 years, thanks to a thief, one of India's longest-running murder mystery cases was finally solved. What do you think about this story? Please share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe and complete 30,000 subscribers. Thank you.